Because last week we was just going over like uh, questions that people may have had on the laws regarding the first um, commandments that we read in Exodus 20 and 21 and 22 uh, and also 23. So today we'll be in Exodus 24. Um, so let's get to it. Exodus chapter 24. And we're going to see the bonding of the covenant today. All right. Very important. Very important topic. Very important lesson that we're going to get into with Exodus chapter 24. So let's see what it says. So in Exodus chapter 24, is everybody there? All right, so now, yeah. says in verse one, uh, and he said unto Moses, come up unto the father, thou and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the father, but they shall not come nay, neither shall the people go up with him. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and the judgments and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Father has said we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Father and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. It says, And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings, of oxen unto the father and Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar verse 7 he said and he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people and they said all that the father has said we will do and be obedient and Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said behold the blood of the covenant which the father had made with you Concerning all these words. Now, this is very important right here. All right, we see that he read the book of the law or the book of the covenant to all the people. And he said he took oxen, which is what? He took this, off, this oxen for a burnt offering because he's setting up a covenant. When you have a covenant or when you make an oath or when you perform a vow, you make a sacrifice because you seal that uh, contract or that covenant with blood. He said right here that he took the book of the covenant in verse 7. And read in the audience of the people, meaning he read all these laws. He read these commandments. He read the punishments for them. And he read the curses and the blessings that went along with it. And he said, after this, all that the Father has said we will do and we will be obedient. But verse 8 says, and Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Father hath made with you concerning all these words. Now, what does this mean? Moses took the basin, meaning the blood that was shed from the oxen, and he started putting his hand in it and sprinkling on everybody in the audience. Why is he doing this? All right, once again, this goes back to the point that we have to know what we're reading and can't just be reading words. All right, this is not the first time this has happened. Or, now I ain't gonna say the first time, but this is not the only time that this has happened. All right, this has also happened in Matthew with the blood of Christ. So let's go to that right quick. Let's see that. Let's go to Matthew 27. We're going to start at verse 15 to see the second time, because this is the first covenant. All right, we in the old, that was the old covenant being established. That was the establishment of it. So now let's look at Matthew chapter 27. And let's see the same thing occurring. All right, because this is a question that I've been asked, as well as a concept that goes with what we just read in Matthew or in Exodus chapter 24. It says in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 15. All right, we're going to read verse 15 through 26. All right, so let's look at this. It says in Matthew 27 and 15. Matthew 27 and 15, for whoever just came on the call, uh, shalom to you. It says in verse 15, now at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. This feast is talking about the feast of Passover. It said the governor of the people, they always released a person from prison on the Passover. Okay, that was a custom. 
It says, and they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. A notable prisoner. What do you think a notable prisoner is? A person who's known for violence, who's known for evil, who's known for excessive um, degrees of crime. It said they had a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate, Pilate is the governor or the Roman general who was ruling over the land of Israel at this moment. All right, this is a Roman. This is not an Israelite. It says, Pilate said unto them, talking about the children of Israel, whom will ye have or whom will ye that I release unto you? It says Barabbas or Christ, which is called, or excuse me, Jesus, who is called Christ. So now he's giving them a choice. He said, would you rather me release this notable prisoner out to you, this man who's known for violence, who's known for crime, or would you rather me release this just man in Christ? They say in verse 18, for he know, or excuse me, for he knew that for envy they had delivered him. It says, when he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him saying, have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. It says in verse 20, but the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Christ. It says the chief of the elders and the, uh, the priests, they persuaded the multitude. Who's the multitude? The rest of the children of Israel. Why would they persuade the multitude to destroy Christ? Why would they do this? Let's see why. It says in verse 21, the governor answered and said unto them, whether of the twine will ye that I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas, they said, release this notable prisoner on us. And Pilate said unto them, what shall I do then with Christ? Which is called, excuse me, Jesus, which is called Christ. They all said unto him, let him be crucified. Meaning let him get put to death. Let his blood be shed. It says, and the governor said, why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, let him be crucified. Verse 24, when Pilate saw that he could not or could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made. So they started getting uh, uh, angry. A tumult is when you have a, a group of people and they, they start to get frustrated. They start to get rowdy. They start to uh, get riotous. It said a tumult was made. It says, he took water and washed his hand before the multitude. Why is he washing his hand? Because he doesn't want that blood on him. All right, that's very significant. I'm telling you, we're going to get to it. He's washing his hand. Pilate is washing his hand because he don't want the blood on him. He doesn't realize what this blood is. It says he washed his hand. What was that? At verse uh, 24, it says he washed his hands before the multitude saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Meaning, go ahead and crucify him. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and our children. The multitudes, the children of Israel. They said, let his blood, hold on. Save all questions for once we finish this. All right, hold your question. Don't forget it. Write it down if you need to. All right, but let me finish this. Um, once I finish, um, we'll get any questions after that. But now, anyway, the point is, they said, let his blood be upon us and our children. What does that mean? Didn't Moses just say he took the blood in the basin and he put his hand in there and he said, behold, the bond of the covenant, walking about through the midst of all the children of Israel, the millions of the children of Israel at that time, sprinkling blood on them. All right, we're going to get a full understanding of what he's doing, but we're just showing you that this ain't happened that time only. This happening right here. It said, verse 26, they released, then released he Barabbas unto them. And when uh, he had scored Christ, he delivered him to be crucified. So now Christ has been delivered. His blood has now been shed. And they said, let his blood be on us. Why? Because Christ had to do this because he's a lamb. We saw that the oxen was brought in Exodus 24. They had to bring a sacrifice. So what the blood could be established in that covenant. So let's go back to that and look at that one more time in Exodus 24. So we can see this again. It says in Exodus chapter 24, and I'm gonna read verse seven and eight one more time. And then we're gonna get an understanding of what it means. Why is he doing blood? He could have sprinkled water. 
He could have sprinkled holy water. He could have sprinkled oil. He could have sprinkled, you know, you know, some, some ashes, some water with ashes on it. Why did he use blood? Why did they say let the blood of Christ be on us? We'll get that in a minute. It says in Exodus 24 and 7. So once again, he took the book of the covenant. What is a covenant? Somebody tell me what a covenant is. Right, this is an agreement. Agreement. It's a, it's, it's agreement. Exa agreement. Exactly. Thank you. That's how that's how it should be. Everybody should be in unison. Everybody knows as soon as I ask that, you got like four or five people saying it's an agreement. It's a, it's a contract. All right. It's an oath that you make. It's a promise that I'm going to do this and you're going to do that. And we're going to come together in unison. All right. He said he read the book, the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, meaning he letting everybody know what the roles are, what your responsibilities are. And they said, all that the father has said, we will do and be obedient. They ain't say we're going to do some of the things. They ain't say we're going to do half of the things. They said all that he said we will do and we will be obedient. It says in verse 8, and Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people, meaning he actually took blood and put it on you. Put the blood on you. Did he only pour it on them? Was the covenant only made with them? These are the questions that we're going to answer throughout this lesson. It said, behold, the blood of the covenant. Why did he use blood? which the father had made with you concerning all these words. So let's see why he used blood and not oil or water or anything like that. Let's go to Leviticus 17. And we're going to read verse 11. Leviticus chapter 17. And we're going to read verse 11 to see what is the significance of blood? What is the significance of that? All right, Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11. Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11, once again, to see the significance of blood and what is the purpose of it. it says in verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. It says the life. What is the life? It's what keeps you breathing. It's what keeps you living. It's what keeps you going. It's your source. It's your energy. It said the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. What does that word atonement mean? Well, when you look that word up, that word is nephar, all right, which means to cover. What did the people just say in Matthew 27? Let his blood be upon us. If something is on you, it's covering you. You're covered in blood. Moses took the blood, he sprinkled it on the people. They're not covered in blood. It said, I've given it to you to make an atonement for your souls. An atonement is like a covering, but it's also like a cleansing. Meaning what? This is talking about when you give a sacrifice. All sins require blood, all of them. Which is why every time you committed a sin, you had to bring a lamb or a ram or a goat or an oxen or whatever the case may be. All sins require blood. But sometimes that blood from that animal or that burnt offering, sometimes that blood wasn't good enough. Sometimes you committed a sin that was so grievous, that was so terrible that that blood wasn't going to suffice. You had to give or you had to shed your own blood. All right. We all know this because we know that we have sins that are punishable by death. So the blood is what makes the atonement for you. That's why when you commit this sin, you have to bring this offering so that your soul could be cleansed. Because it's like you're making yourself dirty. Think about it now. When you have a long day at work, you didn't worked out or you, you didn't been sweating. Or, you know, you may have gotten dirty. You got to go home. You got to take a shower to cleanse your physical body because you've gotten dirty throughout the day. That's the same concept spiritually. When you commit sin, that's like you going out and you playing in the mud. When you commit sin, that's like you working out. You have been all sweaty and dirty and filthy, musty and all that. Now you got to come home and you got to take a shower. So when you commit those sins, you got to bring that sacrifice to the altar to cleanse your spiritual body. It says... For the blood, excuse me, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for your soul. I mean, this blood is like soap and water to you, to your spirit. This blood is like uh, the, the things that you need to cleanse yourself. All right. So 
Now we see some of the significance of blood, but why is he using the blood for them in the form of a covenant? Let's turn back to the next, uh, to the last chapter in chapter 16 in Leviticus. Previous chapter before Leviticus 17, let's go to Leviticus 16 and we're going to start at verse 5. Because we're going to see that blood, not only does blood cover you, it makes an atonement for you. It puts you under something, covers you, but it also hollows you. It also sanctifies you. It says in Leviticus chapter 16, I'm going to start at verse 5. It says, and he took, excuse me, he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel, two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. That he is talking about Aaron, right? He shall take two kids for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Verse six, and Aaron shall offer his bullock for the sin offering, which is for himself and make an atonement for himself and for his house. So the most I said, before you could offer a sacrifice for the congregation, before you can do that, before you cleanse them, you got to cleanse yourself first. Before you, as the leader, as the priest, do these things for the rest of the body, you have to cleanse yourself first. So now you got to bring your own bullock for not only you, but also your house. All right. And we've seen examples like that where a man, his household was not in order. You had a man like Lee, uh, Eli, whose two sons were wicked. Most had to punish him because he didn't discipline his son. So Aaron has to cleanse his house first. It says, verse 8, it says, And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the father and the other lot for a scapegoat. All right, so he said he cast lots, meaning he has to choose which one are you going to make the scapegoat, which one are you going to make for the most high. All right. It says in verse 9, He shall bring the goat which the father's lot fell, and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat in which the lot fell uh, to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the father to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the father and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small and bring it within the veil he shall put the incense upon the fire before the father that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the, ta the testimony that he died not and he shall take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his, his blood without, or excuse me, within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. Verse 16 is the point. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place, meaning he shall cover the holy place, cleanse the holy place from what? Because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, going back to that same point that we just made. When you commit sins, you, you become dirty, you become filthy. So you got to be cleansed. It said that he may, uh, because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so shall he do to the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Verse 17, and there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation, which he, uh, when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation uh, of Israel. Now let's jump to verse 30. It says in verse 30, for on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you that ye may be clean from all your sins before the father. So, this is what um, the blood is doing. The blood is hollowing the holy place. It's sanctifying it. So now this blood that Moses is sprinkling on the people is symbolic of not only are you being brought under the bond of the covenant, you're being covered with blood, but this blood is also hollowing you. All right, it's making you or sanctifying you to a degree. We saw that, we know that when Aaron and the priests were sanctified, Moses had to take the blood and put it on them, on their right ear, on their right finger, 
their right thumb and their right um, big toe. Okay? Same thing with the people. Now, this covenant is like a what? It's like a marriage. We know that the Most High and the children of Israel are spiritually married to each other. This is what this covenant is. It's a covenant of marriage. All right? Because we know that when you get married, you form an agreement with the other person. And y'all establish vows. You establish oaths. I'm going to perform this role to you. You're going to perform this role to me. Same way with the Most High. He said, I'm going to perform the role. I'm going to be your, uh, your God. He said, you're going to be my people. But let's see that. Let's go to Jeremiah 3 and let's prove that this marriage covenant, um, excuse me, that this covenant is actually, in fact, a marriage. Jeremiah chapter 3. And we're going to start in verse 6. So go to Jeremiah chapter 3, and we're going to start at verse 6 so we can prove that this covenant that we're reading about in Exodus um, chapter 24 is, yes, it is, in fact, a marriage covenant. That's why there's blood being required. All right? Jeremiah chapter 3, and we're going to start at verse 6. I'm telling you, because blood is very important. It's very important in understanding what this oath or what this covenant is all right it's very important because once you establish a blood covenant there is no going back all right there is no you know i know i said that then but down the line it's not the same most i say he does not change so if he established this blood covenant with the children of israel it's not going to be a thing where oh years later that covenant is now null and void because i feel like it Yes. Bless you, Cam. So, Jeremiah chapter 3, we're going to start at verse 6. See what it says. It says, And the Father said unto me in the days of Josiah the king. All right, we should remember about Josiah. We read about him in 2 King. Has thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. Said the Most High said that the children of Israel, they went upon every high mountain and under every green tree and played the harlot. What does this mean? It means that, I got you, bro. <laughs> I got you. It means that we are his wife, right? And by going under every high, or on every high mountain, what does that represent? It represents you serving other gods, all right? Because you're married to him, that's like a man and a wife, and his wife goes and bees with another man that's what this is like he said you went on every high mountain meaning you go on a high mountain to praise a god that's what you go on a high mountain for said it under every green tree you go under a green tree because those are groves that's where you go to sacrifice to other gods and he said you dare play the harlot now the harlot how do you play a harlot by serving other gods unless the dynamic between the children of israel and the most high is that that of a husband and a wife it says in verse 7, And I said, after she had done all these things, Turn thou unto me, but she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw when for all the, the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I put her away. Notice he said they committed adultery. How do you commit adultery against God? Unless you serve other gods. How do you commit adultery if you're not in a marriage? So you notice this, this covenant that we're reading about in Exodus 24 this is a marriage covenant. We are his wife. All right, it says, they committed adultery and I had put her away and given her a bill of divorcement. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. Showing you what it's talking about, the separation in the kingdom. We read about that in 1 Kings chapter 12. When Rehoboam became king and, the, and Israel was divided. Now the Mosai has to deal with them as two separate entities. He dealt with Israel. Israel went off first. Judah didn't go off as much as Israel. That's why he said her treachery, her sister saw her deeds. Judah saw that Israel was wicked. Remember, because Judah had a lot of, you know, they had some righteous kings. Israel ain't had no righteous kings. So when he said Judah saw Israel, meaning the tribe or the kingdom of Judah saw the kingdom of Israel and how wicked they were. And it said they did likewise they started going off likewise that's why he brought the assyrians against the northern kingdom first 
and then he brought the children or the Babylonians against the children of Judah later because later was when you saw what your sister did and you did the same thing. It says in verse nine, and it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom and she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. What are stones and stocks? We're talking about the material that they made other gods with. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah had not turned unto me with her whole heart, but faintly said unto the Lord. And the father said unto me, the backsliding Israel had justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words to the north and say, return thou backsliding Israel, said the father. And I will not cause my anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, said the father. And I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thy iniquity. Talking about repentance. You acknowledge and you turn away. Say, only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou has transgressed against the father thy Elohim and has scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree. And ye have not obeyed my voice, said the father. Didn't we just read in Exodus 24 that they said all that the father has said we would do and be obedient? So that means if you don't do that, you what? You transgress the covenant. You broke your oath. You broke your your agreement. It says in verse 14, Turn, O backsliding children, said the father, for I am married unto you. He straight up said it. We don't have to make an implication. We don't have to make an application. He straight up said, I'm married to you. When did he get married to you? He got married to you when we just read in Exodus. But he put the blood on you. All right, we're going to see a physical example of that next. It says, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Notice, these are the promises. He said, I'm going to be your God. That means what? I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you a heritage. I'm going to give you an inheritance. I'm going to bring you to Zion. I'm going to take you one of the city and two of a family. It says, and I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understand it. All right, so now let's see a physical example of this. Let's see how or what would happen if a person broke a covenant with another person. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Let's see the law about breaking covenants. All right. Deuteronomy 22, we're going to start at verse 13. We're going to start at verse 13. Deuteronomy. Chapter 22. And we're going to start at verse 13 because we're reading about Exodus 24. And we see that the blood is being placed on the children of Israel. And that blood, I cannot stress enough how important that blood is. You have the blood on you. We see that the blood is for you to make an atonement, a cleansing. It's to cover you. That blood is also to hollow you, to sanctify you, to make you clean, to make you holy, to make you separated. He poured his blood on the children of Israel. And he said, I'm married to you. This is the marriage vow. This is the law about marriage. Talking about the same exact thing. You come into that coat, that, uh, that covenant, you make that oath, and now you have to shed his blood. Deuteronomy 22 and verse 13. It says, If a man take a wife, didn't the Most High take a wife? Mm -hmm. Took the children of Israel. It said, If a man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her, meaning what? If a man establish a covenant with a woman, we see the Most High establish a covenant with the children of Israel. It says, And they consummate this marriage. It says, He hate her. Why would he hate her? It says in verse 14, and give occasions of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her. Didn't we just read that the Most High brought up an evil name upon us? He called us treacherous. He said her treacherous sister Judah. He said her backsliding Israel. He brought up an evil name. We just read it. it. says, and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman, the Most High took us, his wife, says, and, I, and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. You look at this word maid. This word maid means a virgin woman. 
when a virgin woman has intercourse for the first time, what does she shed? She shed blood. This is the blood that Moses is sprinkling on you. Consummation. So now this blood is your proof, is the establishment that we are now in a covenant. That's what that is. He says, found her not a maid. How do we know that this word maid is actually talking about a virgin? Well, let's read it in context. It says in verse 15, then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate. It said the tokens of her virginity. What is the tokens? A token is a proof of something. It's a proof. It's showing you that this is my proof that I'm in this covenant. What's the tokens? That means that when a woman is shedding blood, she has to take the cloth. She has to wipe this blood and give it to her parents. This is my proof right here. It says, The father shall bring forth the tokens of the damsel virginity unto the elders of the city and the gate. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife. And he hated her. And lo, he had given occasion a speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid, and yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. And they shall spread the cloth for the elders of the city. That's how you know that this cloth, you have to wipe that blood so it can be proof. It says, they shall spread the cloth, and the elders of the city shall take that man and chastise him, and shall immerse him in a hundred shekels of silver, and give them unto the father of the damsel, because he had brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel, and she shall be his wife. He may not put her away all his days. This is very important because if she don't have this cloth, see what happens. But if the thing be true and the tokens of virginity be not found for the damsel, then they shall bring out the damsel unto the door of her father's house. And the men of her city shall stone her with stones that she died because she had wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house. So shall thou put evil away from among you. So now this blood, if you didn't have proof of this blood, and you didn't have the tokens. What's the tokens that you're in the covenant now? Your good works. Your deeds. Your faith. This is the proof that I'm trying to establish this covenant with the Most High. If you don't have this cloth, if you don't have these tokens, you're not establishing this covenant. You're not establishing the covenant that the Most High gave because they said all the words that he said we will do and be obedient. This is your proof. Sprinkled the blood on you and said, this is what you have to do now. Now, when you take a wife, you give her a role. You give her a job. You give her a function. When the Most High took us to be his wife, what was our role? To serve him. To serve him. Let's go back and see. All right, because we are supposed to be his servants. But how do we serve him? Let's go to Exodus 19, because we read that two weeks ago. Let's go back to Exodus 19. Let's see the role that the Most High established for his wife. Because now you took, you've taken her to be your wife, but now you have to give her a function. She's supposed to be your help me. If we're a wife to the most high, that means we're his help me. What does he want us to do? Follow his laws. Follow his laws and commandments. All right, we're going to read it though. Let's read it in Exodus 19. We're going to read verse 5 and 6. All right, because once again, we read that the damsel, if she don't have this blood or this proof, it's not looking good for her. Just like it wasn't looking good for Israel. Brought, you, brought us in captivity. Put us in slavery. People got killed. Men died in war. Women and children taken as captives. It's not looking good. Because you didn't have the proof or the tokens of your virginity. You didn't have the proof that you established a covenant. You didn't have that. Once again, that proof, those tokens, is for you to follow these commandments and to have good works and to have faith. This is your proof of this covenant. So, we're in Exodus 19. We're going to read verse 5 and 6. And let's see the role that our husband, the Most High, established for us. It says in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5, Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, that's what Cam just said. You obey his voice. What did he tell you? He told you to keep his commandments. If you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasures unto me. Didn't we call the congregation peculiar treasures of Jeshurun? Mm -hmm. 
You procure your treasures of Jeshurun and listening to this lesson right now. He said, you'll be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. A kingdom. Now we know the priests are only the sons of Aaron. But whatever they do, you gonna do as a nation. You shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. This is the role that we have. A kingdom of priests and a holy nation, a separate nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And remember, when you read this word children, when you look up this word children in Hebrew, that word is ben, and that word means sons. So mainly the Most High is speaking to the men because like we know, the hierarchy is God, Christ, man, woman. So now when I'm, it's like a, it's like a, uh, it's like a job that you work. I'm a regular worker. Regional manager, they don't talk to me. They're not gonna talk to me. They're not gonna say, you know, these are the these are the plans that we have for the progression of this company. You'll never hear a regional manager talk to a regular store employee like that. What they're gonna do is they're gonna talk to the district manager. The district manager is gonna talk to your store manager, and then your store manager is gonna relate a message to you. So the Most High said, I'm speaking to the children of Israel, the sons of Israel, and the man is the head. So now you take this message and you relay this down to your family. And each of your households walk together in unison because y'all all receiving the same information. So these are the words that you should speak to the children of Israel. So now this is our role to be the priest. And what did the priest do? The priest ministered in the name of the father. They didn't do this all the same way. They didn't all have the same function. They all had different categories, different roles, different functions, different jobs that they did to progress the, the oneness and the unity of the faith. Let's read that. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 and let's see how we minister to the Most High. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to read verse 4 through 13. Because it said, once again, we're married to the Most High. We know this because the blood was sprinkled on us. That same blood that binds a man and a woman in a marriage. And now we're married to the Most High. <laughs> But it don't stop there. Once you're married, your husband gives you a robe, gives you a job because you are his help me. The woman is a help me, like it says in Genesis chapter two and verse 21. So now if the woman is a help me, then we're the most highest woman. We have to be his help me. We have to perform the role that he wants us to perform. What role is that? He told you you'll be a nation of priests. What is the job of the priest? Their job is to minister in the name of the Father. So let's see how we do that. Ephesians 4 and 4. And we're going to read through verse 13. Ephesians 4 and 4. All right, once again, you're supposed to be a nation of priests. So, the priests have a job, and their job is to minister. There's not only one way to minister. There's not only one way to progress the oneness or the unity of the body. So each man, each woman, has a particular role in performing to help the progression of the ministry. It says in Ephesians 4 and 4, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope, of your calling. I mean, in all of our callings, even though you may have a different calling, it's for the same purpose. It says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Elohim and father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. It says, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Every one of us is given grace. Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he had ascended, what is it but that he also descended first unto the lower parts of the earth? Why does he descend to the lower parts of the earth? Talking about where we dwell. Let's see. It says that he descend in the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might uh, fill all things. And he gave some apostles. Says some in your role in the ministry, your role to progress the oneness of this faith. 
He said, some are apostles. What is an apostle doing? An apostle writes letters and sends them to churches when they have different grievances and problems. He said, some apostles. He said, and some prophets. Some people are prophets. He said, a prophet. A prophet is a person who gets messages from the Most High directly to give to the people. You see, Moses was a prophet. Isaiah was a prophet. Jeremiah was a prophet. But was everybody prophets? No. Because that might not have been your job. That might not have been your function. It says some prophets and some evangelists. What is evangelist? An evangelist is a person who goes out and speaks to random people. Trying to bring them in. Trying to reel them into the faith. Who may not be in it. it says some evangelists. Some pastors and teachers. It says in verse, four, or in verse 12. They do this for the perfecting of the saints. For the work of of the ministry don't the priests do the ministry they perform the work of the tabernacle of the congregation this is your job this is your function to perfect the unity of the saints says in verse uh 12 for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of christ edifying giving knowledge giving information it says in verse 13 till we all come and to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of Elohim unto a perfect man. See, you ain't a perfect man yet. This is what we strive to be. This is the work that we put in. This is how you know that you're under the bond of the covenant. This is how you know that the blood is covering you. It says, unto a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The stature is like how you stand. When you come up to that form, when you, you know, if you slouch down, if you bent over, you're not, you're not, you're not in your full stature. But when you rise up high with your chest out and your head up, you've come to the fullness of your stature. What does that mean? That means you come unto this perfect man. It says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man, by the cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. This is your work. This is your job as the wife of the Most High, as the help me. You have to push his ministry in whatever role and whatever function that he has given to you. This is our role. So now he sprinkled the blood on the people, the first generation Israelites in Exodus 24. Was that covenant only with them? Because we didn't get sprinkled with blood. We didn't get sprinkled with blood. Our parents didn't get sprinkled with blood. Our grandparents ain't get sprinkled with blood. Our great-grandparents ain't get sprinkled with blood. Only they got sprinkled with blood. During the time of Christ, they said that the blood be on us. We didn't get that blood either. But does that mean that you're not in this covenant? Well, let's find out. Let's go to Deuteronomy 29. Now, let's see. Deuteronomy chapter 29. We're going to find out whether or not this blood is on you the same way it was on your ancestors. In Exodus 24, and this is the same blood that's on you from Matthew 27. Deuteronomy 29, and we're going to see whether this blood is on you or not. Deuteronomy chapter 29, we're going to read verse 1 and 2, we're going to jump to verse 12. Now, what chapter was previous from this? If it's at 29, what was the previous chapter? 28. What's in Deuteronomy 28? The blessings and the curses. The blessings and the curses. The tokens. The proof that you're in this covenant. If you don't have this proof, what happened? You're going to be cursed. If you didn't have this blood on you, if the blood is not on you, you're cursed. You're put in slavery. You're cursed in the city, in, in the field. You're serving other idols. You're being brought under every nation. You're getting killed in the streets. You're cursed. Deuteronomy 29, verse 1. So these are the words of the covenant which the Father commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. We just read about the covenant in Horeb. This is an extension of this covenant. He said, and Moses called all Israel and said unto them, 
Ye have seen all that the Father did before your eyes in the land of Egypt unto Pharaoh and unto his servants and unto all his lands. The great temptations which I, I saw, have seen, excuse me, the signs and those great miracles. Now, we didn't see that. We didn't see that. We read it. We read it. We didn't see it. Jump to verse 12. All those signs, all those wonders, why did he do that? What was the purpose? It says that thou shouldest enter into the covenant which the father thy Elohim and into his oath. That's why he did that, to make you his wife. And it says, which the father thy Elohim maketh with thee this day, that he may establish to uh, thee today for a people unto himself, and that he may be unto thee an Elohim. This is what he said. You're going to be my people. You're going to be my wife, and I'm going to be your God. I'm going to be your husband. As he hath said unto thee, and as he hath sworn unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. It says, neither with you only do I make this covenant and this oath. I ain't just made this covenant with you. Even though you're the only ones that saw that. You saw those miracles. You saw me speaking out of the mountain with the cloud ascending up, with the fire and the trumpet. You heard my voice speaking the Ten Commandments in your ears. And you told Moses, we can't hear you. We, we don't want the Most High to talk to us. You go and talk to him. You didn't hear that. You don't know how scary that was. You don't know the power. You don't know the magnitude of the Most High's voice. You ain't see that. You ain't hear it. He said, but not with you only do I make this covenant and this oath. It says in verse 15, but with him that standeth here with us this day, before the Father our Elohim, I mean, just the one, this one that's standing here today, the ones that was there alive, says, and also with him that is not here with us this day. Who's the ones that's not here? The children that are not yet born. The seed that has not been brought forth. These are the ones who are not here. Talking about what? Talking about you. Talking about your parents. Talking about your grandparents. Talking about your great grandparents. Talking about your children. <laughs> And your grandchildren and your great grandchildren. Him that is not here this day. This is why the people in Matthew 27 said, Let his blood not only be upon us, but let his blood just be upon us. Let it be upon our children too. And Pilate, he washed his hands. He didn't even know what that meant. He didn't even understand the purpose. That's why he washed his hands. We want the blood on us. Why would we want the blood on us? Because we're going to take this blood and we're going to wipe it with a cloth so that we have proof that we're in this covenant with him. So the final scripture that we're going to in this lesson is Genesis 15. We're going to read verse 1 through 18. To once again prove without a shadow of a doubt that this covenant that you're reading about in Exodus 24 is very important. It's very important. There's blood that's sprinkled on you. Not only does it cover you like the blood of a ram or the blood of a goat or the blood of a, a, a lamb covers your sins, but it also hollows you. It makes you separated. It makes you holy. All right. Genesis 15, we're going to start at verse 1. It says... Uh, oh, you need some more time? Yeah, Genesis 15. Genesis 15, we're going to start at verse 1. All right, because once again, we read in Deuteronomy 29 that the Most High said that he's going to establish this covenant that he swore to our fathers. To who? To Abraham. It was the first man he made this covenant with. The first person. He showed him everything. Everything. In one dream. He showed him I'm going to save you from your enemies. I'm going to bring you into captivity. I'm bring you right back. Because this is my oath. This is my covenant that I'm going to perform with you. Not just with you, but also with your children. It says in Genesis 15 and 1. After these things, the word of the father came unto Abram in a vision. Saying, fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy great reward. What's a shield do? A shield protects you. It covers you, don't it? Mm -hmm. shield covers you. It says, and thy great reward. Exceeding great reward. It says, and Abram said, Father Elohim, what wilt thou give me, saying I go childless? Like, what are you going to give me? I don't even have no children. 
And the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is my heir. Meaning the person who's born in my house, whatever reward you have for me, this exceeding great reward, it's not going to pass down to my children because I don't have no children. It's going to pass down to my steward, meaning my chief servant. I need a seed. That's what Abraham is telling the Mosai. He says, and behold, the word of the father came unto him, saying, this shall not be thy heir. But he that shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be thy heir. Notice Abraham is only talking about his actual son. He's not thinking down the line where you're talking about millions of generations in the past, thousands of generations, hundreds of generations. He's talking about his actual son, Isaac. Says, and he brought him forth in verse 5, and he brought him forth and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them, he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Look what the Most High said. He told you to look at the stars, see if you can number them. Abraham is only talking about his, his one, you know, he's talking about Isaac. He ain't talking about no great grandchildren, no great, 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 all down the line. Most High looking. Way to the point where he bring the children of Israel back into their land. That's when you're going to be as the stars of heaven that can't be counted for multitude, like it says in Revelation chapter 7. So you can't number them. It says in, once again in verse 5, he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars that thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed on the Father and he counted to him for righteousness. So Abraham believed. He had faith. First thing he had, a token of his covenant. It says, and he said unto him, I am the father that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit. Don't the Most High say the same thing to us? I'm the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt. We was being oppressed in Egypt. We was under oppression. He said the same thing to Abraham. He must not have been going through. He must have been going through some stuff in Ur of the Chaldees. He said, I brought you out of there. It says, and he said, Lord Elohim, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Abraham told the Most High, what proof can you give me? What can you give me or what token can you give me to establish this word that you're saying that you're going to be my shield? You're going to be my exceeding great reward. I'm going to have children as the stars of heaven. They're going to inherit this land. What proof are you going to give me of this? That's what Abraham is asking the Most High right now. See what the Most High say. In verse 9, and he said unto him, take a heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. What do all these things have in common? A heifer, a goat, a she-goat, a she-lamb, uh, uh, a, she a turtle dove and a pigeon. These are all the sacrifices in Leviticus chapter 1 for burnt offerings. Why do you bring a burnt offering? Because the blood is what makes an atonement. These are all the sacrifices you can give. Deer is clean. You can eat deer, but you can't sacrifice it. Because this blood is not going to cover your sin. But cows do. A heifer. Rams do. Goats do. Turtle doves and pigeons do. He made a blood covenant with Abraham. That's what he did. Told him, take the blood of all these things. And do what? It says in verse 10, he took of, uh, excuse me, in verse 10, and he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst. When you divide them, don't the blood come out? Then Moses take the blood of the oxen and what he did with it? Cover the people. Christ shed his blood. He's the lamb, ain't he? A lamb without blemish. Take the blood, cover the people and their children. Moses told Abraham, take the blood and do what? Divide the mist and lay each peach one against another, but the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcass, Abraham drove them away. Verse 12. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know for a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. Was Isaac in a land that was not his? No, he was in the land of Israel. So what seed is he talking about? He's talking about his seed all the way down the line to where he bring them back. Let's find that out. 
It says, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. And that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. How many people think this is talking about Egypt? This ain't talking about Egypt. They weren't in Egypt for 400 years. They were not in Egypt for 400 years. So who is this talking about? Who is this people that's going to come out with great substance? It's talking about the children of Israel when the Most High brings that day to bring the children of Israel back into the land. These are the ones who are going to come out with great substance. Because we saw that the children of Israel, they came to the land of Egypt and they get right back out. Came into the land. We read about that in 2 Kings, didn't we? We read about that in Jeremiah chapter 3. We talked about backsliding Israel. Who took Israel out the land? The Assyrians. We talked about her treacherous sister Judah. Who took Judah out the land? The Babylonians. So how he came out with great substance? It says, Afterward they shall come out with great substance, and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, hold up, why did he say the fourth generation? They shall come hither. If this was talking about Egypt, it just said that he's going to come out with great substance. So why in verse 16 does it say, but in the fourth generation, they shall come hither. I mean, they're going to come here to this land. He's talking about the children of Israel that he brought out of Egypt. That fourth generation, I'm going to bring them here. Again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And in the same day, what the Most High did. The Father made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. He made a covenant with him. Established by a heifer of three years, a she-goat of three years, a she-lamb of three years, a turtle dove and a pigeon made a blood covenant. This is what the Most High has done to you in Exodus 24. This is what he did again in Matthew 27. Establishing the covenant, bringing you under the bond of the covenant, making atonement for your soul, cleansing you, sanctifying you, and making you his wife. And you need this blood. You need to have proof of this blood. You need to have the tokens of your virginity. By performing those good works, by being obedient to his voice, by having faith, exactly like our father Abraham did, it said in verse 6, he believed. Most High counted for him for righteousness. This is that blood that's on you. Keep it on you. Put it on you every day. Use it to cover you. Use it to sanctify you. Because if you don't have it, just like if that woman ain't have it, you're brought out to the door of your father's house and you will put to death. That's why in the law, when you read things like um, Deuteronomy 17 and verse 2 when they talk about transgressing the Most High's covenant and serving other gods what happened to you? you think they took that lightly? we done made this oath with the Most High to be his wife, to be his help me and you serving other gods? It wasn't looking good for you this is how you have to maintain the covenant alright? because this is the only way matter of fact let's go to that too let's go to Leviticus 26 Let's go to that because this is the only way. This is the only way that the Most High is going to establish this covenant again. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 40 through 42. And after this, this will be the end of the lesson on blood covenant. <coughs> Leviticus 26, verse 40 through 42. says in verse 40 in Leviticus chapter 26 it says they shall confess their iniquity we keep reading about the same thing bro same thing read about this Jeremiah 3 Mosiah said I divorced her but she will confess her iniquity and turn again unto me it says that they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers you're not repenting for just your sins 
26, Leviticus 26 and 40. Oh, you said 40. Yeah, 40. It says in verse 40, I'll read it again. If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers. Because remember, when the Most High made, he made, he put the blood on the first generation, but they didn't go into captivity. The first or the second or the third, they didn't go into slavery. You went to slavery. They weren't in the land of their captivity. You were in the land of your captivity. They didn't get sold on slave ships. They didn't get put under all nations. That happened to you. He said, if they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespass against me, and also they have walked contrary unto me. It says in that I also have walked contrary unto them. Say he walked contrary unto us. How does he walk contrary unto us? Because in those same curses, in that same covenant, when the Most High said that it pleased him to do well to you, when you don't have this blood, these good works, this faith, he said it's going to please me to put you to hurt. That's how you walk contrary to us. He says, now walk contrary unto them and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts be humble and they accept the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember and I will remember the land. The land that he just told us in Genesis 15 and 18 from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. This is our inheritance. This is the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the covenant that we have to maintain, that we have to take hold on and that we have to be under the bond of. So make sure this blood that was sprinkled from the first generation, make sure you have it as your token. All right, so um, I know some people had uh, questions and things like that. Uh, you had some, Cam? Yeah, going back to Matthew 27. Uh-huh. Um, let me go to the verse right there. Um, Matthew 27? No, Matthew 25. No, we was in 27. We was in 27, and we read verse 25. Um, what did it say? When he was talking about um, the man washed his hands, and he said that his blood wouldn't, I mean, his blood wouldn't be upon him. Yes. And our uh, answer said that it'll be upon us. us and our children. Yes. Our children. Uh, when he said our children, that means that the Israelites down the line, right? Of course. All right. That's why we read Deuteronomy 29. Because he said, I don't make this covenant with you here today, but him who is not here. The him who was not here could be the him who's not here three generations from now. That could be the him who was not here four generations from now. That could be the him who was not here 20 generations from now. That could be the him who was not here a hundred generations from now. Him who's not here. It's very broad, showing you what. It ain't just talking about your children. And when you when it says your children, remember, Abraham, when he said I go childless, he was talking about his immediate his immediate child. He was talking about Isaac. The most high. He was talking about all of his children down the line. Until they're ones that he chooses to come back into the land. So when the Bible says children. It don't just talk, it's not just talking about your literal biological children that comes from you. Just like when the Bible says fathers. It talks about our fathers. But then it names Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, it's talking about all of those Israelites down the line. All right? Any more questions about the blood covenant or anything that we've read? If not, we'll move on. So, let's go back to Exodus 24 and let's finish that chapter. <clears throat> 